to this online lesson with Bishop Emma Einerson. We are here today with a Grill a Bishop session. It's one of my favorite lessons that we do every year, and we're really happy to have Bishop Emma with us today. Bishop Emma, how are you today? I'm really well, thank you, Charlie. We are going to be looking at Bishop Emma's journey uh, to becoming a bishop, and then we're going to be looking at your questions. Bishop Emma, have you always been a Christian, and how did you make the decision that you wanted to believe in Jesus? So I was brought up um, going to church, so my mum went to church, my dad didn't go to church, my dad wasn't a Christian, uh, but my mum took me along to church, so I, I think I can never remember a time when I didn't know about Jesus, and didn't um, know, you know, study the Bible and be part of a worshipping community. So I would say that's been part of my background all through my life. But I think there have been various points where I've had to choose that for myself and say, this isn't just my mum's faith. This isn't just my kind of family faith. This is my faith. And I think for me, one of the key moments was when I left home at 18. Um, I took a gap year. I went to work as a part of a Christian community in North Devon called Lee Abbey. Um, and it was kind of going there and choosing to do that, that it was a choice to say, yes, actually, I am a Christian, not just my family or oh, my mum is a Christian and I want to follow Jesus. Okay and so what sort of things were really helpful for you in making that that commitment? I think it was you know like like most teenagers uh, I'd been through various stages of wrestling with faith and doubt and thinking you know is this true is it really true that Jesus lived and died and rose for me and what difference does it make for my life but I think it was coming to the point of thinking well if there is a meaning to life, there has to be some meaning to life. This is probably about the best description that I've heard. Um, and nothing, it took more faith for me to believe that Christianity was not true than that it was true. Um, and that was sort of, that was the mind stuff. I guess that was also coupled with a heart belief. Um, you know, just sort of people say things like knowing Jesus in my heart. And I think if you're not a Christian, you think, what's that? That just sounds a bit weird. Um, but actually, for me, that was true. I just knew that Jesus loved me and that had, he died for me and and was with me. So it was almost something that I couldn't walk away from, even if I wanted to. Um, because if I'd walked away, Jesus would just follow me. <laughs> so before you can become a bishop in the Church of England, you have to become a priest. Can you tell us a bit about what led you to that? Um, I've been a priest. So I was ordained, which is what they say when you become a priest uh, for 20 years, just over 20 years. So um, it, I won't let you guess how old I am, but uh, it was kind of in my mid my mid 20s that I begin to began to think, um, what does God want me to do with my life? Um, I was at the time studying at university. I was doing a PhD um, in uh, linguistics and theology. And I kind of thought, well, I could become a lecturer. Um, that's, that's what my dad did. That's what I might end up doing. Um, but then also doing quite a lot of stuff in my church and leading some services, leading a youth group, doing some uh, all age worship stuff and thinking, do you know, the thing that really gives me life is that that I do in, in my church. And I think I could probably do that all the time. That would be OK. Um, and then sort of wrestling with a sense of does is that what God wants me to do? Um, is he calling me to do that? At the time, there weren't loads and loads of female priests around. So I didn't have masses of role models to draw upon for that. Um, but there were one or two who really encouraged me and said, yeah, you know, this might be something for you. And so after a long process of praying and thinking and talking to others um, and discerning, um, decided that that's that's what I was going to do. You've mentioned there that you've been ordained for, for 20 years now and you've become a bishop. How does that how does that happen? Basically, um, you know, it's, it's a bit like a combination of any job interview. So I came up here to, come, to Cumbria about three years ago now and had an interview with Bishop James, who's the Bishop of Carlisle and some other representatives from the diocese. Um, they interviewed a few people and um, together we discerned that that God might be calling me to come here and to be a bishop in uh, in the Diocese of Carlisle. Because it's not something that you can apply for, is it? You have to kind of be nominated. Yes, that's true. So some people, somebody once asked me, you know, how do you apply to be a bishop? And I kind of say, well, it, no, it applies for you. So um, 
there's a real sense, I think, that the, the church listens out and watches out for the people that it would like to be bishops. Basically, I ended up being um, thought of in that way. And then, and then, as I said, there is a, a normal interview process as well, like you would have in any job. So it's a little bit of a combination of um, people discerning together and praying and finding out what God wants. You've made it. And now can you tell us what does a bishop do? Well, it's interesting when you say you've made it, you know, it, it's a funny, it's a funny way of looking at it, isn't it? I, I actually think, you know, the best job in the Church of England is, is to be on the ground, is to be a youth worker, is to be a, a parish priest. You know, I think those those are really exciting jobs. I think bishops are, are really just here to serve everybody else in the church. So if it's a hierarchy thing, I like to think of turning the hierarchy upside down and saying, bishops are there at the bottom supporting the rest of the church. So that's really how I see my role. Um, I'm there to support the clergy in the diocese and lay leaders. When we say lay leaders, we mean people who don't have dog collars around their necks, um, which is a lot of people in the church. So um, what do I do? Well, at the moment, like most people, I do a lot of stuff on a screen, <laughs> like this interview. Um, as for all of us, my life has pretty much gone online. So various groups, various committee meetings that I have to go to on a screen. At the moment, I'm doing quite a lot of recording of sermons. Um, I really love preaching and teaching. That's a big part of what I think my ministry is. And because I can't go to churches and do that, which is what I would do most of the time, um, I'm recording services. So quite a lot of in front of a camera stuff, uh, lots of meetings, lots of just trying to support people, Praying, you know, it's great part of my job. I get paid to pray. Um, that's part of the role of a, a bishop. I represent the church. So, you know, if there's an issue that needs a comment or if there's an article that needs writing, so it's part of the role of, of bishops to comment on the issues that are affecting us in society today. So it's a really varied job. I don't think any two days are the same. Do you have any particular things that you really, really enjoy about your role? I really enjoy encouraging people, particularly younger people. So there was a moment a few days ago where I've, I've written some um, materials in, in the Diocese of Carlisle. We've just had a chance to kind of refresh our vision and we have a new vision set of priorities, which are follow daily, speak boldly, care deeply and tread gently. I've written some um, study group notes, just some questions and some comments and things that groups can use to, um, to discuss those and to say, okay, that's fine. Those sound like funky words. What does that mean for our context here on the ground? And I heard of a, a group of younger people. So actually um, year six, seven, eight at, at school who were along with their, one of their church minister, ministers going to be studying these materials together for the next few weeks. Well, that gives me great joy. That's brilliant. I love it when I can watch and encourage young people in their faith. So we're now going to move on to the questions that have been sent in. So these questions have been sent in by secondary school students from across Cumbria and Lancashire. So if you're up for it, it's time to grill a bishop. Let's go for it. They're great questions. They really are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our first question is, why is Jesus so important? This is one of those questions that I think you could answer on lots of different levels. So I'm going to try a few. Jesus is a really important figure in history. I think there is very little doubt that Jesus existed. Uh, records have been found uh, alongside the Bible to suggest that Jesus existed. He lived, he died and something happened. We now have a church worldwide of billions of people who believe in Jesus. So and we talk about things like BC and AD, before Christ and after Christ, there is no doubt that the Christ event, if you like to use a sort of technical term, is a key point in history and has influenced history. Um, and Christianity has had such a massive influence around the world, just in the way we, we think about law, the way we think about education. Um, so there are all sorts of reasons why historically Jesus Christ is important. Jesus Christ is important theologically, and, and by that I mean, if you are a Christian, Jesus Christ is the very centre of faith. Jesus is the way that we know what God is like. Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life. Nobody else has done that. And so 
if we look to Jesus, we see what God is like. We see how we are meant to live and we see what God would want to say to us in life. Jesus teachings. Um, there's a lot of acceptance that Jesus teachings in themselves, even if you sort of don't believe he was God, that Jesus teachings are a good way to live. You know, stuff about caring for each other, stuff about turning the other cheek, stuff about um, the last shall be first. You know, they're, they're a really good way of running society. So I think Jesus is really important theologically. For me, Jesus is really important because he is my saviour and I love him and I know he loves me and it's a relationship. So there's the kind of massive Jesus of history stuff. There's the Jesus of the Bible stuff. It's all the same Jesus and it's the Jesus who I know and love stuff. So our next question is, uh, to what degree do you think rules in the Bible change and develop with modern times and modern ideas? Well, the Bible doesn't change. The Bible was written, it's, uh, it's actually a, a set of books, it's not just one book, it's a library of 66 different books written over a span of um, two, nearly 2,000 years. So it's a whole different set of kinds of literature. And some of it is history, some of it is poetry, some of it is an account of the life of Jesus, the bits at the end are letters. Um, and so I think we do need, when we look at the Bible, we need to understand that and we need to say, okay, well, what kind of writing is this? And, um, you know, is, is Genesis a literal account? You know, were there really seven days? Were there really two animals that went into an ark? You know, and, and we might say, well, these days, modern science would say that some of those things might look differently, but perhaps Genesis wasn't meant to be a scientific account. Perhaps it would meant, was meant to be a, a story about how God made the world um, and how we're to live well in it. So the Bible doesn't change, but we need to read the Bible with the lens that the Bible wants us to read it with. And sometimes that might involve saying, well, where are we today? You know, what do we know culturally today that maybe they didn't know 2000 years ago or they didn't know uh, in the time of Abraham? You know, maybe there's scientific advances that we now need to say, oh, OK, well, let's let's read the Bible again, knowing this and see what it says to us today. I firmly believe that the Bible is truth and the Bible is God's word to us. But we mustn't be lazy when reading it and we mustn't just say, well, you know, I, I can't be bothered to study it, I just think it's wrong, or I can't be bothered to study it, I just think it's totally right and literal in the words that are on the page. We need to use our brains and we need to come with who we are as 21st century people to it. So the Bible doesn't change, but we need to wrestle with how we interpret it. Another brilliant question here. Why did God create the earth? Oh, yeah, this is a great one, isn't it? Why did God create the world? Because he could. I mean, you know, if if you were God and you were there. Um, and uh, by the way, this is the point at which my mind gets blown, because, you know, when you start to think about time and before time and God existing before time, my little brain doesn't really do that. But, you know, God has existed throughout the whole of time. Nobody ever made God. So there wasn't a point where God wasn't. So if you were God and you were there what would you want to do? You'd want to create, wouldn't you? You'd want to make something. You'd want to, I think God is creativity. God is love, as I've just said. So if you are love and there isn't a world, then you want there to be a world. And if you're going to make a world, you're going to make it good. You're going to make it with mountains and trees and flowers, and you're going to make people um, because you want people to be something like you. The Bible tells us that people are made in the image of God. So there's all sorts of ways that we could understand it but there's something of God's fingerprints on all of us. This next question is one that I, I often really struggle to, to answer when young people ask me but what happens to good people who aren't Christians when they die? I'm going to answer this in a really simple way Charlie and say I don't know. <laughs> and that is a perfectly good answer. Well you might think it's a cop-out answer but I think it's a well thought out answer. And I think the reason I say I don't know is because I am not God. And I don't know what happens on the other side of death. What I do know is that God does promise eternal life. And I do know uh, that to accept God's promise of eternal life is to live on. I mean, you know, I'll let you know after I die what that's like, but uh, I'm not there yet, so I can't tell you exactly that. But God does promise life um, and a life that doesn't end in Jesus. 
what happens if people have not consciously accepted that offer? I don't know. I know God is love. I know God is holy. Uh, and I know God will decide what happens with people. But to say any more than that, I think, is to to be presumptuous, probably, and to put ourselves in the place of God. So moving things actually very topically, our next question uh, focuses on the pandemic. And it simply is, why hasn't God stopped the coronavirus? Yeah, Paul, this comes down to that really difficult question, doesn't it, of why doesn't God intervene in suffering? Uh, why hasn't God stopped the coronavirus? Well, when God made the world, he made it good. And as the Genesis account tells us, you know, with everything I just said about, we have to understand that um, as not a, a sort of scientific account, but a story, a true story, but a, a story. Um, human beings have disobeyed God and, and evil and sin and suffering have come into the world. Now, I don't think that means just people doing bad. I think it means that the whole of creation, the whole of the cosmos, whole of the natural world suffers, you know, and groans. Um, we have earthquakes, we have sickness, we have coronavirus. So all is not well in the world. And I don't think we need to look very far just to know that. Could God put a stop to that? Well, yes, I guess he could in that he's powerful. He can do anything. You know, if he can make the world, he can intervene in the world. Thing is, if he did, what would that say about free will? You know, if, if God comes in and stops coronavirus, what else does he need to do? What else does he need to intervene in? Does he need to find me a parking space every time I can't find one? You know, how far does, how far does that go? Um, so this is a really tricky question because it's talking about the whole question of, of human free will. And God isn't a puppet master who just moves the pieces around in his world and fixes things and sorts things out and makes people do things. However, I do think God is there in the suffering. And what God does is to give us brains and hearts. Um, he gives us the brains that mean people can be doctors he gives us the intelligence that means that vaccines can be delivered he gives us compassion that means we can um people can dress in ppe and hold the hands of somebody who's dying at the bedside um he gives us spirits that want to pray for suffering um he gives he gives us as human beings the ability to put things right or to make things better even in the midst of suffering and I think above all, God weeps with us. So when he sees the people who've died of coronavirus, um, his heart is breaking. You know, this is not a dispassionate God who just sits there. Um, he is with us in the suffering. I think that's what Jesus' death on the cross tells us, that God himself knows what suffering is like. And he's with us in it. Can you be a Christian and a scientist? Well, I've, I love this question and I feel like saying, um, uh, OK, I'll go and ask my friends who are Christians and scientists. <laughs> and I think they would probably say, yes, you can. Um, there are lots of Christians who are scientists. There are people like John Polkinghorne, John Lennox, um, Francis Crick. Now, I could name endless people who have worked right at the cutting edge of science who are Christians as well. And I, I think sometimes you'd have to ask them and perhaps it would be a good interview for a future a future interview like this but probably Chris, Christian faith and science science are not always trying to answer the same question or answer them in the same way I think maybe if Christian faith is saying why you know why do we exist what's all of this about what is the meaning of life science is saying how and what and they're they're not in contradiction contradiction to each other but they're in slightly different categories if you like they're maybe not trying to do the same thing but I think they're entirely complementary I mean I, a lot of my friends who are scientists um, say that when they look at the things of science you know in biology when you study the structure of a cell when you st study the human body you think wow this is amazing you know how did this come to be and and that actually leads them to worship and to think wow god you're great you're amazing you did this so I, I would encourage all of you who are interested in science to, to look at faith and I'd encourage all of you that are Christians to consider a, a scientific career. We need both. So what does God think about climate change? Well, I think the Bible shows us that God thinks his creation is amazing. 
and God, when he made the world, when he made the seas, the skies, um, everything was good. Everything was very much in balance. Um, but in Genesis, it says again and again, it was very good. It was very good. And of course, as, as humans, we've not always lived out that goodness in creation. And we have done things that lead to the destruction of creation. Um, and I think that makes God sad. You know, I, I think God loves the world, not just the people in it, but the whole world. He does love the people in it. But he loves everything, all of human um, humanity and creation, the natural world. So I, what does God think about climate change? I, I think he would like us to work to, to stop destructive climate change. I think he would like us to think carefully about the choices that we make. Um, I think he thinks it's great when Christians campaign against destructive climate change. Um, so is God, an is God an environmentalist? Yeah, you bet he is. And that leads us really nicely on to our next point, which is, would you speak out against the government if you thought they were disobeying God? Yes. That's the simple answer. And now the slightly longer answer is, I guess you have to ask the question, what does disobeying God look like we're blessed whatever we think about the current government and its policies um you know we are blessed with a fairly stable governmental system in the uk in some parts of the world that is not the case and in some parts of the world christians have actually taken some real risks to speak out against what they see as human rights abuses and to speak out in favour of the oppressed and the vulnerable. Um, and I think that is an entirely Christian thing to do. In, in the Bible, there is a real culture of protest sometimes um, and of not just uh, being meek and mild, but actually getting angry about the things that make God angry. So if governments are doing things that make God angry, then I, I expect Christians to get involved. But but there's always that that wrestling, you know, what is within the law? How do I need to live well within this society? And following on from that, does the Bible say anything about politics or who should lead a country? Um, yes, the Bible says quite a lot about politics, actually, especially the, the Old Testament. There's lots of stories about kings and and how they uh, and rulers and how they govern countries, both for good or for ill. So there's, there's a lot to be learned from some of the stories of um you know, King David and, and, and Deborah, who was a judge over her people. And there's some really good leadership lessons in the Bible. So the Bible does say things about politics. Jesus says quite a lot of things about politics. You know, Jesus talks about um, making sure that we, we look after the least of these, that we feed the poor, that we don't always put ourselves first. Um, Jesus' politics were actually what got him crucified, you know, because he was speaking out against the oppressive Roman um, occupiers of his country and saying, no, actually, you know, you, you oppress the poor and you don't worship God. And so that got him into a lot of trouble. So I think that the Bible is, does say a lot about politics. I don't think it says a lot about who should lead a country. I think it says quite a lot about what kind of person should lead a country. Um, and they should be people who have compassion. They should be people who um, are able to put the last and the least um, in the centre. You know, they are people who should be uh, have a sense of justice. So there are things about who should lead, lead a country. But I don't think God, I think God very rarely says, you know, I want this person and not that person to be elected. It's back to the free will thing. It, it, he you know, I think God would be happy that we have free and fair elections. So we've got two questions here, which are both huge, and they're based around morality and human rights. So the first one is, is morality absolute or relative or a mix of both? And if so, how do you know which is which? Is morality absolute or relative? Both. It, there is definitely good and definitely evil. And Christians have a sense, um, not Christians only, actually people, because we are made in the, in the image of God, have a sense of right and wrong. And God has given us that. And so that, I, in a sense, would be an absolute thing. However, our perceptions are warped. We're not perfect people. You know, we don't always have a sense of perfect perception about what is right and wrong. And sometimes... We can be very selfish and although we know what's right we don't choose it and so we need systems and structures in place that help us to live right lives 
And sometimes those are relative. Sometimes those are determined by the con the context and the culture that we're in at the time. So they do need to change and they need to adapt to circumstances. And the second the second question again is quite a quite a long question, mm. and it says, "How do religious people support human rights? Do you agree with some rights and not others?" For example, uh, the right to marry someone of the same sex and the right for women to become bishops. Yeah, that's a, a long question and a big question with lots of different parts to it. Um, the whole question of human rights. Human rights are really important. Uh, they are enshrined in the Geneva Convention and, and in all sorts of international things that people have signed up to. But I would say you talk about the right for women to become bishops, for example, I would say that I didn't become a bishop because I have a right to. I would say I became a bishop because I have a calling to, and that was a calling that was affirmed by the church. So I think it can be a bit dangerous sometimes when you apply the whole concepts of rights. And you will know that sometimes rights are in conflict with each other. So for instance, in at the moment, in both in Christianity and, and in Islam as well, possibly, there, there's a conversation to be had between religious rights and LGBTI rights. And sometimes um, that sort of wrestling with, well, whose rights trump whose uh, is something that society needs to do together. Society and communities set frameworks around rights. Human rights are not endless. Um, and sometimes religious communities need to be able to set their own boundaries around who can do what, where. So, for instance, at the moment, um, as you mentioned, people can't marry somebody of the same sex in churches. Those are just some of the boundaries that the Christian, that the Church of England, at least at the moment, has around some of those rights. That's, that's a discussion we're having at the moment. In the Church of England, there's a process that we're going through. It's called living in love and faith where we're really looking hard at this and saying, okay, well, traditionally it has been the case that people of the same sex cannot be married in church. Marriage has been seen as between a man and a woman. We know that's a very different place to the way the rest of society talks about this at the moment. And um, people of the same sex can be married um, in, in civil marriages and in, in registry office. So I think it is the responsibility of religious communities to set their boundaries, but to, to look at them and to address them and to think about them for each day and for each age. And that's something that the Church of England um, is doing for itself at the moment. We had lots of discussions around wh whether women could be bishops or not and came to the conclusion that they could only about six years ago. So it's a fairly recent development. Um, we're having similar discussions around um, same sex rights at the moment and I, I can't tell you where those will get to because we're still in the point of discussing things but so yeah another really good question. I love this next question. What do you think is the best way to worship? Do you think that all different types of worship are okay or should it be strict? I love that question too. Uh, what's the best way to worship? That's like asking what's the best way to love or what's the best food to eat? You know um, I think God made us to worship in all sorts of different ways. I think worship in the way that you want to worship. You can worship by walking on a mountainside and you can worship by sitting in a church pew and singing a song and saying some words. I don't think there is a right way to worship. However, I think worship is something that we should probably best do with others. And so together, it will be up to a church community to decide how, how do we want to worship? You know, what is the way that we worship? Is it by singing tunes to an organ or is it by dancing around in the aisles with a guitar? I mean, there isn't, I don't think there is a, neither one is right or wrong, but for different communities, different things might be, might be right. The next question, why do Christians have to evangelise? Well, I, the answer to that is something like, well, why do football fans need to tell everybody else why they support their particular team or why do um if you love somebody why do you need to tell them that you know you, i think christians don't have to evangelize well we're encouraged in the bible to tell others about our faith but we want to we to evangelize simply means to tell other people about your relationship with jesus 
And why would you not? Why would you not want to do that? If if Jesus is somebody you know and love and has changed your life, you want to tell other people about that because it's a good thing and something good has happened in your life. So I think actually we go a bit wrong where we think, oh, well, we must evangelize, um, even though we don't like doing it and nobody wants to be evangelized. Um, it's not about that. It's, it's not the E word. You know, it's just about speaking warmly and naturally about Here's my friend Jesus. I think he's great. Would you like to meet him too? I'm slightly confused by this next question because I'm sure that we <laughs> we might have a different opinion um, on uh, on this to the person who's asking the question. But it says, "Why should I go to church? It's boring and full of old people." <laughs> That's a great. Old people are brilliant, by the way. You know, uh, I, I really love old people, and old people have got so much to teach younger people, and vice versa. So I wouldn't let old people put you off going to church because there's some amazing old people. However, um, I do think we need more churches that have younger people in them. And certainly here in Cumbria, we're looking at more ways of being creative with the way we do church. So it might not just be um, church in a building with pews. You know, there might be a church near you that meets in a school or there's even a church in Cumbria called Mountain Pilgrims, which which goes walking and finds God on the hills. So I think we may, maybe need to slightly adjust what we think of by church. Church isn't just the building, church is the people. So why would you not want to gather with some people who also want to worship God and think meaningfully about life and pray and maybe even sing in the way that we just described? Um, that That's a good thing to do. And we do need people to come and and help us change as a church. So, you know, if you think church is boring and full of old people, then start or join a church and make it lively and full of young people. Uh, and that would be great. Let me know how I can help you with that. Brilliant. Well, Bishop Emma, take a big, deep breath. You have been sufficiently grilled today. And thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much for joining us. Um, is there anything that you would like to say to the young people who are watching this video? Oh, I think I'd just like to say, keep going. You know, this has been a really hard year for you. I know that um, you've done all of your learning online. You've been at home a lot. There's bound to be a lot of uncertainty about what the future holds. But I just want to say you are great. You know, God has put, put his spark of life in you. So whoever you are, wherever you are at the moment, whatever whatever anxieties are on your heart, please know that God loves you and God cares for you and God has a future for you. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all do to shape our world into the future. So thank you for being you. Well, thank you so much, Bishop Emma, for joining us. And I hope that you have a fantastic rest of your day and that you can have a lie down after being grilled. <laughs> thank you, Charlie. It really wasn't too bad at grilling. It was really enjoyable to talk to you. So thank you very much.